is my face somewhere in the screen, by the way, or or is it just the just the uh, slides? Just to know it. Yeah, it's not the slides. Your your face is on the okay, good on the right side. So ah, it is there. Full... Okay. Yeah, it 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 is there. Good. Just full screen. Then I'm I'm not going cool. to go get naked then. Right. Good. Okay. Yeah, that's. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm going to present now, maybe just at least for a second. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to talk talk about uh, web development and the sub subtext basically says everything that it's for over 25 years now web development has been hacks on top of Kludges and that's the best and the worst thing of it, which you will probably see. So yeah, about myself, I can say a little bit. I've been doing this for maybe something like 25 years now. Of course, not professionally for 25 years, maybe 17, 18 years, almost 20 in some case. Yeah, but I'm a generalist anyway. I like to know, I like to know about everything. And in addition to coding, I've also been like teaching coding and preaching and, and writing blogs and doing all kinds of stuff. stuff. And I'm working at this company called Nitor, which is a consultancy. Uh, and I've been there this year, but I'll, I'll get back to it. So yeah, if one considers my own adventures so far, I began with uh, Commodore 64. Hey, I want these ones here. Okay, now it's better. So I got this Commodore 64 when I was a little kid and and computers on those days, they had basic like a pro basic programming language like pre-installed. And if you wanted to do anything, you had to program. So that's how I got into programming. And I programmed the usual text games, which all kids used to program those days, which were all bad. and and stupid. But then in the 90s, I wanted to play a hockey manager game and there were none. So I didn't have any choice but to program one myself. I, and I made three of them in the end of the 90s. And they were pretty popular actually in the Suomi Peli scene. And that's how I got into serious programming. And I had these like dreams of, of uh, becoming this great game designer but then i ran out of money and and encountered reality and i had to go to school and i went to turku polytechnic to become this tridenomy thingy and the school was pretty shitty of course terrible terrible school not the best of schools but i had lots of time to uh, learn this stuff by doing and this is like a generalization that i've been uh, constructing when doing recruiting for the last in the last like 10 15 years that that tradenomies are of course always better than tradenomy but engineers are usually like their level is oftentimes better uh, than the base level of tradenomies and when you go to the university level you have some kind of guarantee that those people know something and there somebody has trying to teach them something uh, serious but of course Basically, the lower you go in these tiers, the more hobbyism and, and one's own enthusiasm about programming uh, is more important. So, so tradenomies can know something, but usually they know something. It's, it's because they've learned it themselves. And, and that's also something that, that I think that I did is that I, <clears throat> I've been learning myself. I don't, know, I don't, by the way, see the chat. I want to see the chat. How does one see the chat? In I can I can throw you comments if someone is. Okay. Chatting. Yeah, do because I I don't see it in this uh, screen sharing mode at all. It seems so. Yeah. Let do that. Where is my present? There is my present. So yeah, and then after school which I used to like that time to teach myself some programming. I failed with my own startup. 
of course I failed because I, I had this wonderful idea and I tried to program it, but I didn't have any contacts or any experience or anything like relevant to succeed. So of course I failed, but I learned something, of course, programming. And then I learned that I didn't know anything, which was nice. And then in 2004, I got the best worst uh, possible workplace that that a person can ever have because it was so bad. It so I I I so weird things happened to me in that first workplace that that I had that I actually write, have written a five part uh, first part of my professional memoirs about that two and almost a half years and. I will send you these slides. Here's the link to the link to the blog post, first part of that that memoir that I wrote. It's in Finnish, but if someone of you know Finnish, I you can read that. But it was it was a great place. Basically, after two months that I have had been there, everybody else who was like responsible of the tech had left and stolen half of the source code and I was left responsible for all the servers, all the programs, all the customers and all everything. And it was a total mess. We had hackers controlling the machines because nobody had run any security patches on, on those servers for like six years and it, un, unbelievable stuff. But in retrospect, I learned so much and it's like incredible that I got so much responsibility like from the get-go and it, it was an amazing opportunity even though it was really stressful I didn't uh, sleep very well and I, I needed some little uh, batches batches of alcohol in the evenings to like sleep correctly because I I was so stressed that everything had everything was burned in the in the morning so yeah it was it was fun and but I got enough of that in a couple of years and I enlisted into this little company called Brain Alliance for some reason. And I got assigned to this real estate startup, Iglo. And I was like, what the what the hell real estate? How boring is that? But actually it was the bestest of places that one could have. We, we did like we were years ahead of the curve there. We had an excellent team and we were building like modern web applications in 2007 when the world was not ready for those. So, so it, was, it was also really great and purely by luck again. And at this time when I was in Brain Alliance, I also began my teaching and lecturing stuff. And yeah, but we had this um, <clears throat> stock enlisted like public company Soprano brought the Brain Alliance in two, 2009 and they began to run it, ran, run it to the ground and we decided that hey uh, if we just do opposite things from that leadership we can't fail any worse and decided to start our own company. So me and my four, four friends left and found a business of our own. And, and again, a nice story. We, got, we all got sued by, by our uh, employer. So if I have one advice for you, it would be that do not sign those non-competition clauses that businesses uh, try to force people to sign because A, they are not valid uh, for normal employees anyway, and they can be used uh, to cause a lot of trouble for you. We managed to like beat that, but it was also very stressful. So don't sign any stupid uh, non-competition competition clauses because they are stupid. But yeah, we grow, grew from zero to like three and a half million euros of yearly revenue, which is, it's, it's still not a big company, but it's a small, it's, it's not a small company. We had like 35 to 40 
employees at the best. But, but yeah, running a business is very stressful. And I did like business development and sales and teaching and mentoring and recruiting and marketing and whatever there was to do to like when you are developing your business. But I felt very unsatisfied because all this is, of course, uh, away from my actual work. And I've never believed in that path where a programmer's next level is like to stop programming and do something else because I, I really like programming. So that's why I just decided that I, I've had enough of this entrepreneur stuff and, and made an exit and sold my shares in the company and decided to just become a regular employee in some other company, which I audited and chose this Nitor one. And now I'm at a customer Veikkaus pro doing the Veikkaus.fi site. So the only legal gambling gambling site in Finland. Yeah, and it's it's been a really weird year this 2020, of course, for apparent reasons. So Veikkaus is actually a pretty good, good place to be in in such a year when when you are at home and they they pay their bills and the work is clean inside <laughs> job so i'm happy happy with that and i can't retire with my with my exit sadly sadly yet so yeah but that's about me uh, you're probably more interested about about web development as a subject than 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 yours truly. So yeah, so of course these are like Captain Obvious kind of statements, but HTML is is of course like in the heart of the web, and it was developed at, developed by Tim Berners Lee. And it was created in 1990 for publication and sharing of scientific documents inside CERN in Switzerland. And here is the first ever web page that is still uh, <clears throat> online, the original web page. And it, it even has like actual HTML looking a little bit weird, but but anyways, I, I did a Google on this next ID and now I know what it means. <laughs> it's just, it's dead, been for 20 years, but yeah. And yeah, here's a picture of the first web server ever that it's in some museum. Yeah, so 1990 and the second core tech is, of course, CSS, which comes from cascading style sheets. And I don't know if any one of you is, is so old that you can remember the times when, when, uh, don't go, when HTML looked like this, that you had these style tags and blinks and font sizes uh, like embedded in your code. But this is the way that we used to style style things and we needed a way to separate presentation from content and thus CSS was born in 1996. And victory of CSS actually caused Netscape the great browser war uh, of the <clears throat> which, which was coming and it, it was funnily because of this JavaScript based uh, style sheets that Netscape advocated for. And I, th I find it humorous when, when you can nowadays do CSS with JavaScript, that the original idea was actually to do it with JavaScript. And I, it would be an interesting, uh, interesting parallel universe where this JavaScript based style sheet had won. But, but it didn't happen, but because Netscape had bet it so heavily on it, its CSS sub support was terrible and the browser went kaput from, from there basically. And so anything can happen. And of course, the core, the third core tech in, in browser is JavaScript, which is just an interim hack to be taken over by Java the moment Java is ready. The, the computers in the middle 90s were not like fast enough to run Java. So Netscape had to invent something 
to you know fill the gap until java is ready so they had this brendan eich guy and he coded the prototype of, of of javascript in a dark closet in two weeks time and the name javascript comes from of course java it was just a marketing ploy and the official uh, name of javascript language is ecmascript which must be like the uh, ugliest name of e that what that ever has been given to something so that's why nobody is using it and javascript is released in 1997 and it's a, it's it's really a weird language and it's forced by the uh, money man the businessman of netscape to look like c or java but so the syntax is c, c or java like but actually the design comes from such languages as as self or scheme i have no idea what these languages are i've never coded anything anything in them but that but they must have prototypal uh, inheritance and stuff like that. But but yeah, by some miracle, this prototype got the important parts right because JavaScript has proven to be like really expressive and versatile language in the years to come. But for the like almost 10 years of its life in the beginning, JavaScript was seen as a toy and an evil thing that should was supposed to be disabled because it had security leaks and and it was basically used for redirecting people to porn or vareds and opening pop-ups and because in those days there were no pop-up protection and computers had like one processor every time you click a link a bad link it basically crashed your computer by opening pop-ups who opened pop-ups and you could you could not get out of that loop so that's why it was more safe to disable it it like totally and yeah it feels pretty odd when you look at things now but that's the that's how the cookie was crumbling back then and of course when when <clears throat> uh, the web is a client server architecture we have this protocol called http and it was published in 1992 and it has a second version from 2015 but again it's just a hack on top of the first one because backwards compatibility has to be like uh, exist so this is something that i wish that somebody had told me when I started that, that you should learn the HTTP protocol because in the end, everything that we do uh, is just like serving stuff up with the protocol. And it has lots, it's, it's not hard, but, but I can honestly say that I didn't understand anything about HTTP when I started my career and it would, ha would have been really useful. And nowadays, I think that it's like mandatory to understand how things work because you, we can't do stuff so badly that we did uh, 20 years ago. And yeah, trust me, we did things really badly. But why I talked about this is actually that uh, it's easy to say that this is this tech stack that we have in the web makes web development so wonderful or or terrible if you want to see that that way because nobody would invent anything like this to do the stuff with, that we do nowadays with it because the tools that we have were meant to be something totally different than they are nobody would <laughs> nobody would invent just such a horror stack to do stuff but that is the strength of the web because you can't break it you have to support the old 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 things and i'll, I'll show you soon but yeah about the history like i said uh web was popularized in 1990s and it led to the development of the first browsers like mosaic and netscape and of course a little bit later internet explorer and everybody needed to have a home page and with the text that we had uh nothing much was really like reasonable i always go back i have 
I've saved basically everything that I've done to the web ever from 1996 or something like that. And every time I go and look at those things that I did, I get this feeling that I'm in the wrong business and I should like go to the Raksa, to the building, to build buildings or something else because they look so terrible. But here is actually the homepage of, let's see. Yeah, <clears throat> Space Jam, a movie from 1996. And this is actually the best, most pretty, fantastic homepage that existed. You couldn't get anything better than this with any money. This was the like top notch. You can, if you go to the site and, and search it you can find a list of people who did it and it's a long list and they used all the high tech of the days there are frames nobody even probably knows what is a frame nowadays there's nice logos and behind the jam tech notes what is tech note oh yeah this is so pretty so but hey it's really responsive. You can use it in your mobile phone. Really nice. So this is how my first projects basically look like. I, I can only think that I went to look at those sites and copy them and, and try to implement something like that. Terrible, terrible. I, I have no idea why, the, why, ba black, why those backgrounds had, had to be black. Uh, is there something else? Oh yeah, nice. This is a little bit newer because this is this has white background and uh, yeah, nice pages, really nice. This this was a popular style, this yellow. Mm, it's so pretty, nice navigation. It has CSS even, really nice, really nice. So yeah, and of course Netscape managed to uh, awaken Microsoft, who wanted to like destroy everything back in the days. Now, nowadays they are the good guys, but back in the days they were the bad guys. So these two vendors competed in everything and Microsoft wa wanted to own the internet. And so it waged a total war against Netscape, which is of course won. Not maybe because only because they had more money and they could use uh, Windows to monopolize the scene, but also because they made a they made a really good they made an actually a really good browser, Internet Explorer six or five or four. They were they were excellent browsers years ahead of Netscape. So, but it, it led to the fact to the uh, <clears throat> place where everything kind of stopped for many years and because Netscape was destroyed. They gave their source code to Mozilla Foundation, which long, long, long time later led to the Firefox uh, family of browsers, but it was a long road. And Microsoft basically stopped developing Internet Explorer. And this organization that, that tried to push web forwards, they just got lost in, in bureaucracy and attempt to like reinvent the web with with these things called XHTML and stuff. And CSS support got better and nothing happened with JavaScript and and stuff like content management systems. We were still in, in the home page uh, era. And those were basically the coolest, coolest stuff that, that one could have in the web. And Flash was the thing for rich internet applications. If one wanted uh, fancy graphics or animations or anything, you had to use Flash. And it was, I didn't ever get into that train at all. But yeah, this is, I like these uh, lessons from history. And I like particularly much the fact that Microsoft actually, actually, uh, ended up saving the web instead of uh, destroying it because uh, <clears throat> they had this Windows update thing 
And somebody noticed that the Windows update, which was working in HTML text, uh, it did something magical. It updated its contents in the background without full page reloads. And they found this uh, XML HTTP request API from uh, Internet Explorer, and it was hidden there. And they just reverse engineered it and implemented it then in their own browsers. And so everything was changed because now you could like uh, get content and update the HTML page uh, without doing a full page reload. And it was magical. It, it really was. I remember the first time that I did it, it, it just felt so felt so great that I could really update the page without doing a, a page reload. And basically this is how web applications were born because now you could do fancy stuff <laughs> in the browser. And this is how the technologies got chosen because you had them and now we had something new and we could really do something like this. This, this was also the time that these first uh, JavaScript libraries uh, enabling us to do something nice like prototype.js and jQuery uh, came to be. And somebody invented this JSON data format instead of XML, which was nice. And, and now we have everything is always working with JSON. So yeah, a good year or good years. I'm still online, by the way. I'm just checking that, that I'm not talking to emptiness again. Say something. Somebody. No, you are not talking to empty. Good. It's then I will well. con continue. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, now because of this Ajax mentality, JavaScript was uh, actually important now. But all JavaScript engines were slow and terrible until Google released Chrome and the V8 JavaScript engine, which was fast and good, and it forced everybody else to move. And also HTML was rebooted with HTML5, which is a standard that, that just like keeps going and going and going. They add new stuff and, and it's okay. Uh, and it's still going. And all, of course, Apple inv invented the smartphone and web moved from the desktop to mobile. And social media was like invented. And ultimately, Microsoft and Windows became quite irrelevant, which was nice. So Microsoft <laughs> caused its own destruction in a sense. That I think that they, they really saved the web as a platform. And this led to the renewal of JavaScript, of course, as a language, uh, because the work that had stalled on the new version of JavaScript was finalized and leading to this new version. And after many years, now they are publishing, of course, a new version of JavaScript every year, which is nice. And this guy named Ryan Dahl extracted the JavaScript engine from Chrome and made it to, made it to work in the server as well, uh, creating this Node.js, which is, of course, still also alive. And after we had Node.js, we could build stuff on top of that. And the first thing that of course, a programming language needs is a package manager. So that was built on top of Node. And when we had this package manager to, to create and, and distribute packages, you, we had suddenly useful JavaScript tooling. And this tooling enabled new tooling. And it's, it's of course, this no, just this uh, snowballing effect that you get. And also new libraries like underscore or angular.js or backbone, which are long dead, hopefully by now we are born. And, and they made the browser development a little bit more sane. It was still terrible, but it was like more tolerable, I think. And JavaScript began to be everywhere, little by little. And finally, I think that maybe in something like 2014 and onwards, we are, we've are we been living this uh, age of JavaScript rena renaissance, I think. And personally, I think that a lot of credit in this uh, renaissance is going to this uh, library called React that, React that was invented by Facebook to solve Facebook's user interface problems. And I think that React was a very, 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 very disruptive 
technology in web development because it really it just like rebooted the scene and I was luckily an, an early adopter on this and we made like really great business and and our people were very happy because we were we were there on the on the right time nowadays in 2020 i think that everybody is of course using react but if one wants to get into web development th this is the this is the family of text that text that one one needs to know uh, in the client side i really i really love it and it's not something that is new but it's new to the web and basically react is just a function of the state so every time the state changes it re-renders everything and the rest is just like semantics and react also like it popularized all of these like prop other texts that are needed to make our our work more more tolerable tolerable like babel babel is a transpiler that transpiler that makes it possible for us to use the new features of the new javascript because you can transform the new javascript to the older javascript which is of course then supported by internet explorer so so without this babel or this webpack a magic tool that bundles everything together we we couldn't use any of these new features because internet explorer doesn't upgrade to support anything so lots of tools are needed to make make this hack work and and yeah so it's nice and of course with react there's also this this philosophy that it's just like doing declarative user interfaces with this idea called react and you can apply it in mobile phones you can apply it in terminal applications or virtual reality things it's so it's it's like a higher level mega trend which is it's really really nice there and the ecosystem around react is is vast and it's evolving very much so there's lots to learn there and some of the trends that uh, <clears throat> have gotten like more to the surfers with the JavaScript Renaissance have been, for example, functional programming. It's not meaning that Haskell or any of these academic uh, languages will like come to the forefront, but the ideas of functional programming and immutable data and and stuff like that, uh, they are they are more popular now and i think that these new texts that we have in web development are like very strongly guiding to thinking thinking of stuff in a functional way i i know this is too i remember when i was young object oriented programming was like the thing that you were supposed to know but nowadays i i never basically do objects object oriented programming i only do functions that transform data basically everything is i i've gone like total totally functional i'm not using haskell or or anything like that but but people are of course uh, in addition to javascript using using things like closure or or anything like that in production too not scala anymore scala was Scala was and went pretty fast, and I, I don't hear anything about Scala anymore. But Clojure and JavaScript, of, at least, are, are uh, pretty functional tool, tools nowadays, and, and it's it's a mega trend that that yeah, it's happening. And lots of these other things are are like not not so generic. I took this slide from my React course, so it's pretty React specific, but. But things are becoming more asynchronous and, and you can do more and more stuff with JavaScript and you have this thing called GraphQL that changes the way that data, uh, data and APIs work. So lots of, lots of stuff uh, have been going on in the last five or six years and it's been a really, really, really uh, <clears throat> disruptive times. Sometimes even a little bit scary or, or frightening or hard tiresome because you have to learn so much all the time and all that all the stuff that you can you learn may go 
like stale so fast. But anyways, why I like this development myself and why I think that, that today is the best time that ever has been to be a web developer is because these texts that, that exist now, they, may, they th tend to make you a better programmer all the time. You can, you can uh, use, you get, you get to like learn stuff that are really nice and you are really productive. I think that if I had to like assess the time scale of things to do, previously it, had, it could have been like two weeks and now with these new tools, it could be like a day or two day or hours. Many things that used to be like basically impossible with the old tools are now like just like that. So it really has gone. I, I really feel that it's gone up a magnitude, uh, these, these things. Of course, it leads to some things that were previously easy are now like infinitely hard because the level of, of abstraction has gone up so much. But, but in general, I think that the tools and the developer experience that one can have in the web now is it's, it's like vastly superior to, to uh, what we had 10 years ago. So that's why I, I like it. And of course, you can, from the facts that, that uh, I've been telling so far, you can, you can probably tell that, that, that lots of, lots of one's concentration in the web business is nowadays uh, going to the front end because stuff has been moving from the server to the, uh, to the, to the client. But of course there's lots of lots more. So this is the classical picture that, that one used to have like 10 years ago that front end is, is really easy. And then the real monsters are, are uh, <clears throat> under the surface in the back end. But then like 10 years later, somebody, somebody uh, drew this picture where, <laughs> where the front end is, is this terrible mess and everything under the surface in the back end is so clean and easy because basically all the stuff from the bottom of the screen has been gone up and what's left in the back end is is just clean, nice APIs and services and stuff like that. So, so yeah, it could be like that. That, that but, but personally, I, I, I of course believe that the truth is this: that everything is a monstrosity. Always, you, everything is always terrible, and and things are always legacy. And the new new tools that they solve some problems, but they create their problems. Pro own problems. So this is probably a more honest description of, of my work where everything is, is like a monster. But that's, that's as sick as, as it may seem. I think that it's, it's one of the primary reasons that I, I love the web so much because it's, it's, I, it has this pioneer spirit, this frontier man's mentality where, where you, could, you do things that nobody has done uh, ever and probably should not be doing ever. So yeah, web is, it, it's a weird platform, but <clears throat> even though it's, it, it is like this, I think that why it has such, such staying power is, is of course that you don't need anything to install it. Brow everybody has a browser and, and you have 7 billion potential clients and users without doing anything. And you just can't beat that. And even though it's a terrible mess, but, but yeah, of course, this is a caricature of, of my work, but, but yeah, in a sense, it's honest. So in the, in the time where, when I've been in the field, uh, if you look at the backend and, and the servers and the architecture that we have uh, within these, the stuff that we are building, we've been moving, moving uh, <clears throat> like up in the abstraction level. First, we used to have these self-maintained servers that we were in our own, own basement and we hosted 
the databases and the email servers and everything ourselves. And, and we coded some spaghetti stuff with Perl and or maybe C++ or anything like that in the middle of the 90s. And, and then we got these better better toolings and better frameworks and languages like Java or PHP or Ruby or whatever. And we still had these servers. And, and then, of course, when web grew, so grew the like number of users. So we had to build clusters of servers. And, and somebody, in, somebody invented at some point this virtualization of, of servers when, when the servers stopped being like physical boxes with one per one installation per, per box because that was really wasteful so they invented these virtual servers and of course after that somebody decided to put uh, virtual servers in the cloud and these mega frameworks like for something like ruby on rails or that they had mvc templating and stuff like that they began to transform into these micro frameworks that, that just handled json or or rest REST JSON APIs because stuff went in the browser and, and things became applications that move data. So yeah, next the next logical steps, somebody invented that, hey, let's just use prepackaged uh, services in the from from the cloud. And somebody said that let's not virtualize the operating systems anymore. Let's virtualize something lighter. So they invented these containers, Docker and stuff like shit like that. And then after these ones, somebody said that, hey, let's not let's build platforms for man managing these containerized workloads and services like Kubernetes, which is really it blows up the head. It's so complex that that I saw this joke when joke where they said that before Joaquin Phoenix played Joker in the Joker movie, he prepared for his role by working with Kubernetes for six months. And I think that it's 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 how it is. It makes one crazy. It's so complex and and high level and and weird. And but the next level, of course, is that serverless computing. Why are you deploying anything except a function? And then you run that function with those services and those uh, stuff that is always now uh, provided by Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud or Azure or any, any other providers that you have in the web. Of course, Amazon is the like biggest one. And that's something that if you want to learn something, just learn Amazon or Google Cloud or uh, somebody is using Azure. They are all the same. When you are work, working with any of these platforms, you are just coding with YAML, and with with YAML, I mean, I don't mean mean the YAML language itself. I mean, like anything that is just like meta work. You just conf, code the configurations, then and, and then everything is like YAML config, and it they, this is where it's it's been going, and. And when I started my career, I, I basically needed to uh, know this LAMP stack, which had, had Linux and Apache and MySQL and PHP. Heck, when I started school, they said to me that learn a bit of HTML and then you can go to a well paid paying job with that skill set. And of course, it was two months before the. Uh, bubble burst with the web in 2000 or 1999 how, which was it but anyways it was it was crazy that you you managed to you had to know html and css and, and a little bit of javascript but nowadays you have to know i i have no idea how people who are coming to the business how they manage junior developers because they're so just so much of this stuff that you had have to know of course the um, basic still skills that I talked about in the in the last last slide they are they are still useful, but they are of they are needed in many cases in a higher level of mutated abstraction of the scale, same skill. For example, if you build stuff on top of Amazon, you need to understand about subnets of private networks because you have to configure those. Uh, 
those things in the YAML config. You don't have to install the server and, and go and configure that server. You just write the config for Amazon who does the, does the stuff, but you still have to understand how email is working or how these services are working and, and communicating, but it's, it's on a higher level. You just, but you still have to know. And because in the web development, you have to know so much. I think that Googling skills is the best possible skill, of course, and learning that you can have because nobody can know everything. You just have to learn the stuff all the time, learn new stuff, look at the old stuff because you're not supposed to remember this stuff, You but, but, but you have to like apply knowledge and, and, and Googling skills. And basically all good programmers, at, at least in this field that I've met, have also been hobbyist coders. So I, I always like to say that you learn to program by, by programming. And I, I, I really believe in that, that you should like, when you are young, I like to say that a programmer is like a racehorse, you know, horse who runs in competitions. You have to spank it until it can't run anymore. And then, then it drops. We are like NHL, like, you know, NHL players. We, we play until we are 40 and then we retire. Of course, we can't retire because we are not being paid so much money than these sports stars. But I think that, that the effort that we have to keep doing if we want to stay on top, it's like incredible. It's, it's not feasible to do that stuff in your work life. I really don't think that it is. But at the same time, you have to remember that, um, of course, there, there can be peers working in the same job that I am that are on a very, very different like interest or, or maybe even a skill level. And everybody does not need to like live for this stuff. I want to live for this stuff. I, it's, it's like the great passion of my life doing this web, web stuff and programming. I really love it. But it, of course, for some people, it's just a work. It's just a job and it's just fine. But if you want to stay on top, I think I really don't know how one can manage without being a hobbyist, having this, <laughs> this as hobby, at least in the beginning of our careers. I'm not definitely in my 40s when I have, have like, stepchildren and, and stuff I want to do other than coding. I, I'm not doing this 24 seven, but, but when I was young, I, I, I did code to the nights and, and spend a lot of energy to trying to get better. And it's like, of course, paid dividends in my later career. And of course, in web development, you, you really need to know the browsers and dev tools and Unix slash Linux terminals. I, I really hope that you are using not Windows because nobody is using Windows in this 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 business. I, well, some are, but they are they are like people look at them like they're crazy or weird at least. And of course, version control, basically Git nowadays. You have to know Git. Put everything in Git. I'm not I I'm not good in Git. I can do like basic merges and rebases and commits and pushes, but, but, but I'm really not a wizard. You don't have to be a wizard, but you have to know it. And of course, some editors and IDs and, and stuff like that. And, and Photoshop, we can never read, get rid of Photoshop. We always need some Photoshopping somewhere. somewhere. So basic Photoshop skills are, are really useful. And of course, databases are all data is always going to live in some database, whether it's in the cloud or, or some physical database. You need to have databases and, and relational databases have always been there and, and they will probably always be there. So you should really learn that. And I always like to tell to young coders that, that if you have no clear reason to pick anything, anything else as your data storage than PostgreSQL, always cho choose PostgreSQL because nobody has been shot because they choose PostgreSQL. It just works always. So it, it's a good. Of course, nowadays they have so many more data, da database types than they had when I was a kid. 
they have graph databases, object databases, key value databases, columnar databases, big data databases, database databases, lots of lots of databases around and, and you just have to try to learn to understand the limitations of your data and then apply that knowledge to choose from the database and always choose PostgreSQL if you have no reason to do otherwise. So it's 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 basically pretty easy. And I hate this full stack developer term myself. I hate it. I hate it with the burning passion. I, I've always hated it. It sounds like a hype word, but but of course I think that to be useful in the field, uh, I like to know at least both front end and back end. I don't think that it's like mandatory nowadays because front end is so complex and there are so many different roles which which come later. But yeah. I like it, and I would suggest that that one who can one one who can do anything is it's is always much more useful from from the guy who can uh, do only a limited subset subset of our work. So yeah, try to do that if necessary. But of course, I think that in the in the later years, the last few years, uh, the roles of designers and developers have been converging really much because. I talked about this React and and the stuff that comes there, component-based design. It's it's like disrupted these uh, style guides and styling things too. And uh, and the art of design systems is is like upcoming. And all these design systems and style guides can live in real, actual, live code nowadays. So there is no handoff, or at least there should no, should be no handoff and designers can easily learn to code react they don't probably learn to map reduce but they can learn to do these user interface components just as well as a programmer and i think that they they should of course if you are a <clears throat> developer you can also apply someone else's design from these components and style guides independently so you don't have to ask or you can't ask help uh, all the time from the de designers. So yeah, it's an interesting development. And of course, nobody, everybody doesn't have to code. You can all, always like go more that way on that scale of designing that you become like a service uh, designer and service like Palo Velo Moto Elia, where you don't, you go deeper into that stuff, but it's in, it's in the same scale. And correspondingly, I think that we used to have this palvelin ylläpitäjä, devop, uh, you know, sys, sysadmins, system administrators, but basically they don't exist anymore because stuff is in the cloud and the infrastructure is code. So why couldn't um, a programmer, a software developer be this upper ops guy too? So devops and, and the uh, art of like running your software yourself as a team or or as a programmer. It's also in the same scale as all this other stuff. So when you go there, you have to like know the op stuff, of course, and 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 Amazon Cloud Development Kit or Cloud Formation or Terraform, which are all these languages that that one use one uses to describe the resources that that they, that are in the cloud. And of course, all the debugging and error hunting is very different in these cloud-based systems. It's much harder if you don't know what you're doing because you just can't log into a server and, and debug anymore. It's really weird. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, but still these basic Unix skills are important because Work is still being done in terminals and, and SSH connections are still being made, but the spectrum has just gone really wide. DevOps is nice and no reason to like separate those roles anymore, I, I think. And of course, one thing that unfortunately gets forgotten all the time is security. And you have probably read about this Vastamo uh, security leak in the last month and I've seen code bases like this Vastamo and 
Sadly, the security stuff seems to be important to the money people only after something happens, because I've audited and read these kinds of code bases as, as the Vastamo too many times. And they always say that, oh my God, I didn't know. Well, if you are a CEO of a company who handles sensitive data, you, sh you better understand this stuff. And, and if you don't... Tuossa on joku credotum tai joku... At credotum.fi tai joku tommonen vastaava. No niin, joku Siihen puhuu nyt puhelimessa siellä. Se on kre credot. Joku credot joku. Hmm. Todella hmm. hämmentävä. Eikä oikein netistä löydy niin kuin tuolla, tuolla päättele mitään. And now he's mute. He's gone. I did that. Yes. My magic. Please so, continue. Yeah. <clears throat> so this vastaama thingi, it's interesting. I actually have read some code written by that Vastaamo CEO allegedly and audited that code base but that he did uh, previously. And if the rumors about the level of the code and the stuff that was bad in the Vastaamo, it's like, it's like criminal negligence. But this is something that we encounter oftentimes in our field. So it is our responsibility even if the money men don't uh, <clears throat> approve, we have to know the security stuff as well. And this OVASP thing is a good place to start. I, I used to teach OVASP and application security also. And it's, it's like a subject that goes really deep and everything is always a compromise. So if you have like, you don't handle sensitive data, you don't have to like, be hardcore in this stuff, but you have the level of your security must be relevant to the stuff that you are doing. And, and it's similar in everything. You just have to like follow these, keep it simple, stupid, and use common sense rules, <laughs> rules in this job and you'll do just fine. But security is just like, it's, it's the last thing that people think and it's, it's, it's bad. Don't let it be like that. I can ask a question. So I do. Uh, how do you see the security now compared to 20 years ago? Because I think that the security is much, much, much more important nowadays. Did we just lack it 20 years ago or what, 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 ha what has happened? Well, nobody understood about anything 20 years ago. I had no, when I began my career, I had no understanding of anything considering security, I think. And maybe it's just the fact that that uh, nobody was storing like sensitive data in the web probably. And you, there were not uh, so much users. I, I don't know. I've been wondering about the same thing. But personally, I also have this feeling actually that the security has been going down lately, actually. I think that 10 years ago, uh, these things were better taken care of than, than they are now in many cases, because with the modern tools and the ways that we are doing stuff, it's easier even, I think, to forget to do things correctly that it was back in the days when everything was like server-based and, and people who started in web development came from the like backend side, but now you can be frontend developer first and then like do everything with JavaScript and your knowledge of this stuff is not maybe at the level it would have been if you come from another direction. So it's better, I, I concur with you, but it is it really, I don't know. I'm, all, I'm always afraid of, everything that I do and other people do considering security. Did I answer your question? I'm not sure. Uh, somewhat, yeah. Just please keep going. Yeah, I think that security is an interesting, interesting subject that, that is often forgotten, uh, sadly. But yeah, <clears throat> one thing that it's, it is interesting that nowadays you can do um, mobile development with JavaScript too, with React Native, or maybe something like Flutter, which is Google's uh, React Native that uses this Dart programming language. And you, 
a developer can be become pretty effective pretty quickly with mobile development. I, I think that I could go to a React Native project and, and be productive there in, in a day or maybe two days. It doesn't mean that I could like deploy the software to the App Store or something like that, which is like uh, specific to mobile, but the basic user interface and application development I could do pretty well, no problem. And but it's it's still not a walk in the park. And I, as an advocate of the web, I believe that these progressive web applications, they might be the future. And this means that you are developing these mobile apps with like purely native uh, browser APIs. And the, the gate that we have in this field now is that Apple is refusing to support these APIs. They are not supporting this service worker thing after many years that is like the basis of all these APIs and they just don't do it. They, they love their app store and the money that they get from it. I think there, there can be no other reason than, than money for them. And it's really humorous because Steve Jobs uh, said in 2006, when he invented the iPhone, he didn't make an app store because he said that HTML5 applications can like basically do everything. So no need for uh, app stores because we have web applications. And I, I want to believe that Steve just had the wisdom to see the truth, but he was like 15 years ahead of his time, which Steve, of course, often time was. So it's interesting to see whether, whether these progressive web apps or native web applications or hybrid web applications are the future. It's an interesting subject that, that I don't have an answer to. I don't particularly enjoy mobile development myself. I, I, I want to keep in my web scope because I, I, I want to believe in the web, but, but yeah, interesting. So this comes, uh, I was a couple years, I, I've been like, uh, <clears throat> doing this kind of lecture for Obu Academy, and they wanted to hear about actual, actually like working in the uh, web development field. So I, I just have a few slides and, and, and can, before you can talk and ask me anything for uh, any amount of time, I'm just going to like talk about the actual work because it might be interesting, hopefully it is. So of course, everything is, by the way, this presentation and, and everything that I always do, it's also open source always. So use as you wish this. It has an open source license, but, but basically everything in the web is based in open source and, and you can do basically anything without paying anybody anything and use free tools. And, and that's, I, I'm, I've always been like an uh, open source free software advocates. And, and I think that this is really important because every, you just need a laptop and you're, you're <laughs> good to go. And of course you can pay for tools and services and these services like Amazon, they package open software, free software tools and charge you for their propri proprietary versions from them. And, and that's something to consider that even though that those platforms are really nice, I like to develop on these platforms. They are also like, uh, <clears throat> threatening the basic freedoms of internet because they are like Apple or Google. They want to like bring you into their gated gardens and make you make you dependent on their version and their software and their infrastructure. So, so it's even though it's like enticing, it's also dangerous for the, for the web. And like I said, Unix Linux is everywhere. Nobody is using Windows. So I'm using Mac in my work work computer, but but if I have an Ubuntu, it's it's just as fine. And I have Windows in my gaming machine, and I I I, I can even do some uh, basic coding with this Windows subsystem for Linux. So I have my Linux inside my Windows. It's not as fast or just like foolproof as a real Unix, but this enables me to do some 
light hobby level work with JavaScript in in Windows, and it's it's nice. Windows has been taking like great leaps forward, but the hate that people like me have for Microsoft in this field is it, we we can't like get over the things that Microsoft tried to do, even though they say that they are the good guys and we are using their software like VS Code and TypeScript and stuff like that. Uh, I didn't, by the way, remember to write anything about TypeScript in my slides because uh, even though I, I use it all, all the time, but remember that we we can discuss it later on. But yeah, open source, free tools, nice. I love them myself and have basically never paid anybody anything except of course Amazon Web Services, which I pay like $40 every month nowadays. So that's nice. So of course, soft skills are really important because at least in consulting, we have I have to talk to customers and other coders and and it's terrible. The, the myth of like this coder who cannot talk. Uh, I don't know whether these traditional smelly nerds exist anymore, hopefully not. And but of course, you you can also work in product development in some startups or some any company that have their own businesses. And and one thing that I, I still try to say in these English lectures is that if you want to work at least in consultancy business, Finnish really still matters with some customers. So if you have no intention of like learning Finnish and you are going to uh, work in Finnish software scene, it's it's going to be harder. It's possible, but I'd suggest that, that at least try to have a will to learn basic level of Finnish that you can communicate with no normally with normal people. And it's sad, but it's true. And of course, there's lots of other stuff than working. For example, stupid meetings. I hate meetings and they're terrible. And I think that patience and grinding are more useful than just like Da Vinci level Renaissance genius, because the code made by these geniuses who are smarter than you, it's, it's like the most dangerous code because regular people can't touch it because it's so smart and its only function is to uh, be smart. Don't be like that. And yeah, social skills. Usually if something is going bad in a project, it's always like communication stuff. And yeah, web development is not rocket science. Generalists do well. I, I, I did the sm short math in school and I am a tradenomy and I've been, I've been okay because I don't have to understand like algorithms that much. If I need to understand algorithms, uh, I ask an engineer or a diploma engineer, what is that in English? I don't even know, or some university guy because they, they know that stuff, but it's not always necessary. Of course, if you go to data science or artificial intelligence, I could never do that because I don't have the skills, but there it's, it's, it's different. It's Python and stuff like that there. So yeah, many roles, many, many things. And of course, in, in web development, not everything is always greenfield, meaning that you start from scratch. All code becomes legacy in some weeks, months, or years, and you ha often have to touch that. So just learn to appreciate legacy code and Boy Scout mentality, meaning that you always leave the code in, in a better better place than it was before you touched it and, and constant refactoring. And it's not, it's not always easy and the money men don't like that, but hey, it's just the way that the software is, is, is being made. And of course there's so many different workplaces. And I think that this is a fantastic job, of course, because it's, it's a clean inside job that pays extremely well. And you just have to find a workplace that like suits your own tastes. I've never liked uh, Tieto or these big corporations because they are so bureau bureaucratic, but hey, they have their good sides too. And yeah, lots of lots of different different uh, businesses around. And this stupid Corona hasn't like affected the field so much, at least for now.
But if the situation continues, who knows? But I, I've been watching at the uh, revenues and the financial statements of our company and its competitors and, and the field. And, and Corona didn't make a big dent, I think. And it's interesting. But of course, at least in consultancy business, uh, where we are like code prostitutes who uh, are being paid to uh, code for somebody else. If things go bad for the customers, there's no work for us. And this is the case, for example, at Finnair. Finnair is, there's nothing going on at Finnair. Every, every consultant and every developer was like uh, laid off indefinitely as the pilots and everybody was so so yeah but generally it's been a lucky place to be during the pandemic because i can be at home and and my work hasn't suffered and and it's weird but yeah it's been a it's, it's been a weird year and continues to be a weird year and considering the things that i i think that you should maybe concentrate on uh, before I, I say any of these, I I really suggest that you read the stuff that I said in 1999 when I was in school, when when uh, when <clears throat> our teacher was te teaching us JavaScript, and I said, whispered to my friend who was sitting next to me that why is that guy teaching us JavaScript? It's like completely useless, and it has, this is like two dimensions that remember that I said this, it's the first thing is that that you can try to listen what I say, but but also remember that I my my thoughts can be really wise like that. I heck I've been using JavaScript for every day for like 15 years. <laughs> so I was so off with that statement. Of course I was young and stupid, but but just always take these oracle kind statements with a grain of salt and and try to remember that try to like keep up with the trends and and follow the follow the like try to find some good good twitter accounts or places reddit or anything where there there's stuff about programming and try to like keep up with the times and and the trends of the times because these can change really fast but some of the interesting things that I would like concentrate if I was I was coming to the field now is of course uh, firstly the cloud providers it's not going to stop and I think that uh, the serverless computing and and these serv services based architectures are, are like they are going to grow nobody is going to like go back to the uh, time where where they had servers in the basement so these are these are so important and. And this meta work and this configuration stuff, this YAML meta work, it's just going to grow. And GraphQL is interesting. It's 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 a technology that that changes the way how APIs work. Uh, instead of these REST JSON APIs, you have this GraphQL where you can, you can like query anything that you need and get it with one request, and then like the bind the user interface straight to the data. It's it's, it's interesting stuff. And of course. This content mesh, these content management systems like WordPress or Drupal or anything like that, they are just like transforming to APIs and this content mesh idea where you solve this issue that you have updatable user maintained content in your web application. This is trying to solve that. It's been a pain point for, for like 20 years and now it's being solved with this Jamstack idea where there's JavaScript APIs and Microsoft and stuff are going to move back and forth from server side to client side and, and build build time and run time. And it's interesting, interesting stuff. And also these low code, no code tools are, are always coming. Uh, and the belief of all programmers always seems to be that, that they cannot replace us, but that's the, like the folly and and at some point they might replace some of our work the level that that these tool design tools like figma or abstract or or anything framer motion and there are lots of like um software that tries to do this and they are getting better so i think that that our level of work in time has to go to 
more advanced level because the easy things will be automated. Maybe robots will take our work totally. Nobody knows. But yeah, um, these progressive web applications, hybrid mobile applications or native applications, it's an interesting subject that, that nobody knows. Web assembly is coming. This, this is this is supposed to be like a new runtime for the web, so you can take any language and 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 uh, compile it to WebAssembly instead of JavaScript, and then you could basically use something like Rust to build web applications more easily, browser side. It's interesting. It's always coming, but I I'm not an expert on that subject. I'm just following it. There's also this. Um, React solved this web component thingy where, where web component is like a self-made uh, HTML component that you can build on top of these standards. But the standards were bad. React does it better. But at some point, uh, interoperability with this, this standard might like change and the standard might, might come to the front in, instead of this proprietary text. But nobody knows. And React has been popular for like six or seven years now. And there is nothing on the horizon to like replace it. But I'm not a believer in the fact that we'll be doing stuff with React for the next 10 years. There's always something that that will come. And you are not supposed to like love the tech. You should be uh, ready for the change. But six or seven years, is a, it's such a long time in our industry. If you go six or seven years back to 2014 when React became to, to like enter the stage, and you go seven years from back from that, you are at the place where jQuery was invented and Ajax was being re reinvented. So React is like it's been like five years, 50% uh, of of the this period. It's been strong, and now it's really strong. But is it eternal? Probably not. Nothing is eternal. So keep keep a watchful eye always on every text and don't love text. Love the mega trends and love the work and be ready to like reinvigorate yourself and not get stuck because getting stuck is probably the most terrible thing that that can happen. I had this getting stuck feeling in 2012, but I was saved by it by the JavaScript renaissance, but I don't want to like end up in that situation anymore. So yeah, I don't have anything else except that I'm open for discussion or any questions. No, no question is like uh, taboo. I will ask, I will answer everything on, on when it's like work related at least. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And now we have uh, 18 participants here. So your your speech has been so well that we got five more people. I'm more popular than Donald Trump. Uh, definitely. So please do ask some questions. Just shout whatever you have on your mind. And to make it easier, I will provide a bonus point for the person who asks the first question. I will also give a bonus, another bonus point. So you get two. Yeah. If it's a good question, you get the third. A boring audience. Nobody asks questions. Okay, when bonus is uh, now uh, sharing, I, I can try to ask. Uh, Please do. What, was, <laughs> uh, what podcast do you recommend to, to listen and be like, keep up with the industry? What podcast? I'm not, I'm not actually, I don't think that I'm listening to any, any programming uh, podcasts myself. I'm like, uh, I have these these different Slack channels where there are lots of uh, like programmers who share interesting stuff. Then I follow some like 
Twitter accounts and, and news sites and, of course, Reddit uh, and stuff like that. But I don't listen to any programming podcasts. I don't, I have never, never listened to any, any uh, programming post podcasts for some reason. I, so I, I don't know. I listen to like lots of history podcasts and stuff like that, but never programming. And do you follow mm-hmm. any YouTubers? Mm, well, I I don't follow any programming programming YouTubers. No, I don't think so. I'm I'm bad at social media because I'm I'm too old. YouTubers and and it's it's like outside my imagination. I think I I need more traditional ways. I'm really dependent. I think that lots of developers are really dependent on this. What is uh, lauma alu? I have no idea. But this group mentality, where where other programmers like share relevant things, I, I at least for me the the community work community of like 150 dev, experienced developers sharing everything stuff from their own sources that they follow so you get this aggregation i have no idea what i would do with if i didn't have this this aggregation of people's knowledge so sima did you have some more questions did i interrupt you uh no different question Thank okay you. Uh, we got uh, another question in the chat so Do you think that there exists a technology that could rival JS and the prevalent frameworks of today in the near future? Or is JavaScript the thing? I think that it it is really hard to like uh, replace JavaScript. I think that WebAssembly is the most like possible thing to replace JavaScript uh, <clears throat> because then you can use any programming language to run it uh, within the browser. And there was actually this one big, big like, big like web application that used Rust and web WebAssembly to run. I don't remember the URL or I don't remember the name, sadly, but I it was the first one and it, it went like without any fanfare in any any media that look we have this now it this is now this is the first one so it might be but but i personally i don't see a big difference there that whether something compiles into like javascript or or whether it compiles to web assembly or anything, because you can take many languages and, and compile them to JavaScript. People are using, for example, Clojure script that, that has its, its advantages and it just like compiled to uh, JavaScript and HTML and, and CSS. But replacing those three texts like in the base, HTML and, and CSS and JavaScript, I believe it's really hard. And people have been trying to do that for 20 years now and nobody has succeeded so who knows i i don't know if i say that that no then somebody will probably do it at the <laughs> at the next possible point but really hard to say i don't believe it that that it's it's on the horizon but web assembly may be that at some point yeah and there is another question mm-hmm. uh, What JavaScript framework slash library do you think is going to be trending in the future, like after React? I don't know. I don't see anything in the horizon uh, after React and the React ecosystem. Of course, it, you can't build anything with React itself. And, and when, when people are talking about React, they are always talking about React with quotes, all the ecosystem like Redux and, and all the tools that, that you need to build a web application. But, but if you think about React and its competitors, I think that Angular is it's like dead in the water. It's not moving anywhere. And then there's, of, there's this Vue, view, is it said? said view but personally i think that views thinking how to 
do stuff. It's like similarly backwards than Angular. And I think that the people who have been adopting Vue and making it like uh, within GitHub stars, just as popular as React, I think that those are the easy targets who think that uh, it, it has this uh, phrase that it's, it's Angular done right. But I'm a firm believer that there is such no, no such thing that Angular done <laughs> done right because it's like so backwards. So then there's Svelte. Svelte is this like frameworkless JavaScript framework that compiles to native JavaScript that has no framework, and it's an interesting thing. Many frameworks are like moving to this direction where they are they are like the frameworks are compiled out of the process, but I've seen no momentum there, like actual actual uh, production momentum. I think that React has gotten to a similar position where, for example, jQuery was seven, eight years ago, that it's, it's become so strong and its usage has become so like it's everywhere. Everybody is using it. So it has so much momentum that it's going to be really hard to to like get rid of that. I think that we will have legacy React sites <laughs> in 20 years from now, probably, if HTML and, and JavaScript still are a tech that, that happens. So <clears throat> I can tell, I'm wondering about this myself. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep my mind open whether uh, there is something. Uh, something that I vigorously follow is, is this state of GS20 uh, site, which monitors. I'm, I'm still screen sharing, am I? Yeah. Yeah. So let's see. Front-end frameworks, for example. This is, is this the newest site, newest version of this? We have results. Hmm, this looks different than I remember. I'm just wondering. Yeah, so here you can see that um, React is like on the top there, spelled the web React Angular Ember. This has lots of different aspects of JavaScript. Uh, for example, JavaScript flavors. I, I yeah, they, nice. Now I remember <laughs> we are backdoor. Uh, I think that this competition is ended. Uh, with TypeScript has become the industry standard uh, on top of JavaScript. If you want typing, uh, TypeScript is the way to go. It won. Flow is flow is dead. There is no such thing anymore. So basically, most professional projects are, are now using TypeScript. Everything is using TypeScript. I think that uh, in, in addition to JavaScript, one, if one should most definitely uh, try to learn TypeScript. So yeah, but to answer finally, ultimately the question, I don't know. I don't see anything in the horizon, but I'm keeping my eye on the horizon because I don't think that we are at React is the final final answer and there there won't be anything else. So but it it's not visible yet. There is no more like safer bet to go with this uh, <clears throat> user interface at the moment. Yeah and then I have a question you just slightly mentioned WordPress and Drupal. How do you see, uh, you, you realize that there are hundreds of millions of web pages built with WordPress. Yes, still I know. the role of WordPress in five or 10 years? An interesting question and interesting uh, subject. I, I started my career in, in, the, in the days when content management was like the primary thing to do in the web. Everybody who began to program for the web, the first thing that they did was, was like five content management systems. And it was the time when everybody had their own content management system and their WordPress was 
Yeah, and Drupal, if they were born, they were like babies and nobody used them and nobody had even heard of them. And then you got WordPress that and Drupal and stuff like that. And WordPress is like basically running 80% of the web still. And WordPress, of course, is using um, PHP and stuff like that. And it's, its code base is not necessarily the most elegant of code bases. Has, Definitely has, not. It's has somebody horrible. been working with WordPress and the loop? Have you, Erno, been working uh, with the loop? I'm just a little bit using use the WordPress. I'm mainly, mainly Drupal guy. And yeah, that, there but, is a reason <clears throat> for that. But yeah, it's an interesting question. I think that uh, I was talking about content mesh, and it's it's the same question that that in in most cases when we are doing some serious projects, they are basically we have needs from the both worlds. We have some content that we need to manage with some content management, and we have a custom web application that we want to build, and we don't want to build the web application on top of uh, Drupal or WordPress because those those platforms are not very good for that. We just want to use the content management as an API and, and, and build our uh, user interfaces with React, not some PHP templates because the PHP templating in WordPress or Drupal, it's just so terrible. It's so ugly. It feels like I'd, I'd rather like slash my wrists than, than go there. I hate it with a burning passion now that I've tasted the sweet fruit of modern text, but 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 the needs are still same. You need uh, I can't even write uh, content for. So now they, there are these uh, API only content management systems like contentful, where let's see, I'm actually it's a good time. Let's see, GitHub, where is my phone? Ah, no, I, I don't need my phone. I have already authenticated. I, I'm actually building my, I've, up, I've maintained this um, dictator uh, information site, dictator Percy for some 20 years. And I'm after like eight years of stagnation, I'm just currently like uh, coding it again. And I'm, I'm using Contentful as my content management system and, and trying out this, uh, doing, this stuff with these texts and it's it's just very 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 uh, in the beginning I just imported some example data and stuff uh, tested this stuff out I've done these projects in in my work life but this is just uh, first time that I've done it personally so this is just API I let's see content let's see where is Hitler Hitler my favorite guy so. I'm just like maintaining my content here as I would in WordPress because it's content is always just data. So data is here and then I can access it via, uh, you know, GraphQL or REST API. But still I can't get that easy, very easily that stuff where I have a content management system and then I get like the pages out of that. I still have to like, of course, code the um, user interface with React and React is of course a client side technology. So I don't necessarily get the indexing and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm still missing some pieces. It's the same with WordPress REST API and WordPress also has this VP GraphQL which was actually bought by this company called Gatsby. We'll get to that in two minutes. Uh, but so you can, and Drupal also in the new versions, I think that it's, it's got a pretty good content API, doesn't it? Definitely. Yeah, so this is the direction that the content management systems are going to. And you get the data, you can query it, you can render your user interface with, with you know, React, but you're still missing some piece. You are missing the uh, glue that builds the website. 
And for this, you have these React-based frameworks like Next, Next.js that you can use to build hybrid static and uh, dynamic sites. So you can get like a content management system and a web application that is built on every time you change your data. It's just like the next JS uh, is like a more traditional one that it works like WordPress, that it, it runs in the server and, and those pages are rendered just like in WordPress, but you use Contentful or something like that for the data. And then you build your user interface with React and then you get the best parts of both worlds. But what I personally for web applications find uh, more interesting, and you can also these days use Next.js in this way is, I'm not wanting to open Messenger, I'm trying to open Gatsby. So Gatsby is a framework also, of course, based on React where, where you build, Gatsby exposes you uh, an internal GraphQL API that you use within Gatsby, and you can query data from all kinds of sources with plugins uh, from Gatsby. And then it, every time the content changes, it builds an incre nowadays incremental, not necessarily incremental, but sometimes incremental build of static files, a static site. And then you can just deploy that static site anywhere. And there is nothing dynamic about it, except if you build a web application on top of that. So basically, you just build a new set of site every time your content changes, and then you deploy those static files. So that is what I, I meant by solving the content mesh, that, that you get the data from these API, API content management systems, WordPress content full Drupal, why not? There are many competitors. And then you just like mash up uh, the data and your dynamic web application that you are building and you, you get everything. So it's been growing these, few, these last few years and it's, it's still an evolving art. But I think that it's, it's a niche that, that has lots of like gains if you go there at the moment. I, I'm very, I'm very interested myself in, in like going there, but it, it's just not like I'm not in a project where this is happening. So now I'm doing it as a hobby. Uh, <clears throat> as my last project in the company that we founded, we were, we did this uh, Telia Esports series site uh, for Telia. And this is built on top of Gatsby. So you can see that it's a, it's a pretty fancy React based normal web application with animations and stuff. But then it has these uh, UTI set and content pages that are built with Gatsby and the content comes from Contentful. So those, this is using it. Uh, the last project internal that we, I did before I left Fractio was to like take our old WordPress site and use the content that we had there and just use it from API and, and build a site, a uh, new homepage with Gatsby, still using the old data that comes from the old WordPress. So we just kind of like switched the user interface layer, but continued using this, the same data source because all the images and blog posts and everything was there. So I think that this is the, way that content management is going to go. Pure APIs that, that use JavaScript and APIs and, and markup to create the sites. Yeah. Semi, sometimes dynamic, sometimes static. Yeah, this same happened with the Tampere University intranet, where at the, the Drupal is as a backend, but it's React in the, in the front. Uh, just as a disclaimer, please show the dictator Percy, as you mentioned, that Hitler is your favorite. This is this is not a political statement, but a, a statement from a person that has been running this kind of a site. 
Yeah, this is just like an informational site about dictators. So this is like 2012 tech, so it's terrible. That's why I don't I don't want to like show it. This is I just have I just haven't had the inspiration like to do this. Look, it doesn't even have like a responsive rendering. It, it doesn't have a phone mode. <laughs> it's so old. <laughs> it it just has a desktop mode. So it's time for me to like rewrite it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. But yeah, now I think that I answered your question. Any more questions? Yeah, please ask. I think we have still room for one more question if there is any. If not, then it's uh, time for dinner at least. Someone has been knocking my door and telling that there is a dinner ready. Nice. So, so very big uh, thanks that you had that time to present this. I, I personally find this very, very interesting. I will send you the slides. Yeah. And you can share them. Yeah. To everybody. This, uh, this um, lecture has been recorded, so I can. Oh, okay. Nice. But I, I can I see black, blackmail you in 10 years. Yes, I'm just changing the. Uh, let's do it now because otherwise I will, I will forget. So anyone with the link can view that is correct, and then I'm just going to give me the copy link, and then I'm I'm stop I'm gonna stop sharing and and you give it to you in the chat right away. Yeah. So